KGRA Radio and Pop Culture Minefield presents Dangerous Military Nerds. Dangerous Military Nerds. They're just like regular nerds, only dangerous. And now, your hosts, Don Ecker and Gary Cassell. I love the way he says Don Ecker. Don <laughs> Ecker. Ecker. Hey. Everybody out there, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. It's uh, one of those kind of days. And I was just telling Gary right before the show started, oh, I I was shocked. Uh, First off, let me tell you that there was nobody in the world that was a bigger Pittsburgh Steeler fan than I was. I know Gary was a big fan. Steeler fan. I love Steelers, man. Favorite team. But I knew, I knew some of those guys. And I'm talking about the classic Steelers. Uh, Rocky Blyer, now one of the only NFL players that was not only a Vietnam vet, but a wounded Vietnam vet. When he came back, he rehabbed his leg And he ended up being one of the starting Steelers. I mean, the guy was amazing. And before I went to the Army, I was a student at California State Teachers College, below Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, Originally, back in those days, I wanted to be a teacher, a school teacher. History was my subject. And, uh, hey... Uh, yeah, you're kind of a nerd after like a that. Year, yeah, yeah, yeah. After a year of that, though, with the way things were politically at the time, I said, screw it. And I went into the Army. I enlisted. Well, when I got back, I went back to Penn State. And at Penn State, I met and knew Franco Harris, one of the greatest running backs of all time. Well, he just passed away at age 72, which when you're where I'm at, 72, believe it or not, doesn't seem that damned old. And uh, Gary, it it, it really knocked me down, bud. No, I feel you, man. Uh, When somebody like that uh, passes away, it really floors you. Um, I'm so grateful. We still got Rocky Blyer, Terry Bradshaw. I think Jack Lambert and Jack Hammer are both still alive, but to yeah. lose the you know one of the greatest running backs uh, in the history of uh, football, uh, Franco is amazing, man. Um, I never forget what he did at that that their first Super Bowl, man. Fuck, what a game! Oh, yeah, yeah. Him yeah. and Rocky Blyer. Well, back in those days. The rivalry was between Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we played, we, the Pittsburgh Steelers, I wasn't a player, but we played Dallas twice for the Super Bowl. And, you know, in 75, Gary, a movie came out that actually featured a good chunk of that second game with the Dallas Cowboys called Black Sunday. Do you remember that? Yeah, I own that movie, dude. I love that movie. Charlton Heston. uh... um, I love the whole concept of them using the old Olympic Stadium, uh, that football game. And um, there's a sniper up in the tower. And it was, of course, echoes of Deadly Texas Tower. No, I'm, I'm talking about the movie... I'm talking oh, about the, the movie. Yes, with the, with the blimp. That's right. Robert the Shaw. Blimp. Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw. I have that movie, Robert too. Shaw. And Bruce Stern. Yeah, Bruce Stern's the bad guy in that, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was a – he had been a, a Vietnam POW. Uh, he – when he was in a POW camp, this is what the storyline was about. Uh, the North Vietnamese allowed some messages to come from his wife who was obviously having an affair with somebody in uh, 
uh, while he was in the prison camp, and it was just totally blowing his mind. And when he came back, the guy just went over the edge, and he associated himself with the terrorists. It it was a uh, a heck of a uh, heck of a movie. Yeah, Robert Shaw, because there were two films that came out about around the same time, that film and Juggernaut, both of them dealing with uh, a vehicle being used at, for a terrorist act. Uh, Juggernaut was a ship, uh, and then that one being the, the blimp. And Yeah, uh, uh, the Goodyear blimp. <laughs> yeah. Great poster, too. I love that poster. But yeah, Black Sunday. Yep, found it right here. Got it. I got it right beh between Billion Dollar Brain, 1968 with Michael Caine, and Brass Target with uh, Burt Lancaster. Yeah. So anyway, this being Christmas week, Gary and I talked the other day, and we were wondering what might be appropriate. For a topic, at least for part of the show. And I had a, a suggestion, which Gary agreed with, a famous, maybe even infamous incident happened literally at the very beginning of the First World War. And it was such an amazing thing that happened that today, and it's been now over a century ago, it seems like a fairy tale. But it was the great Christmas truce of 1914. And oh my Lord, was that a shock. Now, first off, you've got to have a little historical retrospective about what the political events were. At that time, basically, all of Europe was ruled by monarchs. King George in England, Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany. Uh, the, the Low Countries had monarchs. Tsar, the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas. Uh, Austria-Hungary was, was basically governed by monarchs. And in uh, the summer of 1914, in the Balkans, which always was a powder box, Archduke Ferdinand from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was on a tour there. They were trying to get things basically settled down between the Serbs, Croatia, some of the other countries, a lot of, of, of discontent, a lot of hatred, which, hey, you can still see a lot of that even today. And there was an assassination attempt against uh, the Archduke, which failed a very short time later. And I'm talking about hours. Another assassination attempt was made against him. The dumbass didn't get off the streets and go home. And both he and his wife were both killed by a bomb. Now, that set off a chain of effects that basically plunged the entire world into one of the most unbelievably horrific wars in all of our recorded history. Now, when that happened, the Austrian-Hungarians were allied with the Germans, the Russians were allied with the Brits and the French, and things got going. But underneath all of that, was a burgeoning communist revolutionary movement. Although back in those days they called them Bolsheviks. Gary, do you wanna do you wanna jump in there, buddy? No, I'm enjoying this. Um, but uh, uh, basically, you know, my knowledge of uh, World War One comes from you know everything my grandpa told me because he fought in the war. But uh, you're giving a really good history lesson here, my friend. Keep at it. I'm enjoying it. Well, the Germans and the, the Brits had traditionally not always been en enemies. Uh, back during the Napoleonic 
Oh, Here you backdoored it. You backdoored it. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I owe well, I owe somebody something. So let me do this real quick and get it out of the way. We got a backdoor break uh, break in here. Uh, where the fuck are those videos? Uh, I'm confused on on this screen. There it is. Boom. Open your back door, baby. Yo, we're done. Now get back into it, Don. <laughs> you sure? Okay. Yeah, okay. Sure. <laughs> so you know the the Brits and the Germans had not always been at each other's throats during the Napoleonic period. Now Napoleon. When he took over France, before he even made himself the emperor, the French were basically on the march. And they were some bad Jose's back in those days. Uh, Napoleon was basically, at the core, a strictly freaking military genius. And among his army, which basically... Were, were levied from the, the French peasantry when many other militaries were basically professional, like the Brits, okay? Right. The Brits had a professional army. The French, well, they took it another step, and Napoleon started his wars. Now, he displayed his genius on so many occasions that... Uh, it, 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 it would take the whole show just detailing many of those. But the one thing that Britain did have going for it was the Royal Navy. And in many ways, the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy, managed to check the French fleets. They had many engagements. For example, the Battle of Trafalgar was a big one that the Brits basically pulled out of their shorts and uh, ended up defeating uh, the French. The French invaded Egypt, for God's sake, and basically overran Egypt. We can read today, believe it or not, I mean, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but Egyptian hieroglyphics because of a monument stone that French engineers found when they were going through Egypt. The Rosetta Stone, I'm sure everybody's heard of that. Well, that's how today we know how to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. But it was a fascinating time. But the Prussians, the Prussians and the British basically allied themselves against the French. The French and the Germans never got along that well anyway. And you can look at the rest of the 19th century and the 20th century to see what I'm telling you is the God's truth. But Napoleon basically set the stage that at that time literally changed the entire world, not to mention the United States. Napoleon was running shy of money. And Thomas Jefferson in 18 and 3 basically worked a deal out with the French for the princely sum at that time of $15 million and made the Louisiana Purchase, which basically extended the United States all the way to the Pacific Ocean in 1803. Now and think I do, about that. Can I add one more thing in there? Just Absolutely. Because the one thing I remember in, in my history lessons of, of – the war between England and, and France was that uh, they wanted our help because they had helped us in the Revolutionary War. And yes. we said, no, we will give you financial assistance and supplies, but we will not join this fight with you because we saw Britain as our cousins. And they were, uh, you know, we wanted them as an ally. Well, the Brits at that time shoved their thumb in the American eye. Oh yeah, that years. didn't yeah, that didn't stop until the War of 1812. And right. when we kicked their ass the second time, we got it's like we got our our liberty with the first revolutionary war. Well, actually, Gary, it you know, historically speaking, we didn't kick their ass. They kicked our ass until 
the Battle of New Orleans with Andy Jackson. Yep. And we kicked their ass there big time. And the war was already over. The <laughs> Treaty of Ghent had been signed, okay, a couple of weeks before, but there was no way that anybody here in America knew it. The Brits invaded uh, down around the Mississippi and through Louisiana with the idea of taking the city of New Orleans, which would have divided the United States in two. Now, this right. happened in January of 1815. They were going to show those pesky Americans who was who, except they didn't count on General Andrew Jackson, who hated, despised, and loathed the British troops. And you could see why by a saber scar on his face that he had received as a kid from a British officer who also locked his mother, Andy Jackson's mother, and two of his brothers up in a prison barge, and his mother died. So Jackson had a deep, deep hatred for them. Well, he shot their asses off at New Orleans. But and what I love about it is he also threatened his own men. Uh, he says, if any of you retreat or, or leave, go AWOL, I will personally kill you. <laughs> he actually told him, I will murder you. And, uh, and nobody left. They all stayed. Nope. <laughs> Not well, he had, he had everybody join that fight from freed slaves yep. to pirates, for God's sakes, Jean Lafitte and his pirates, and Tennesseans coming down looking for a fight. Okay, from the eastern United States. He had a real Molly Got army down there. Yeah, and but Soul they, Assassin yeah. just brought that up too. Uh didn't the uh is Lafitte, um not Lafayette, Lafitte. Uh he had a hand in stopping the British and helped the United States. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He sure as hell did. But anyway, to get back to World War One. So all this stuff, even a century later, was swirling and swirling. Well, after Ferdinand, Archduke Ferdinand, was, was murdered, the Germans made their move, the Austrian-Hungarians made their move, and that's all it took. And the next thing you knew, the French, the British, the Russians, everybody was, was now in this worldwide war. So the first few months of the war was a war of maneuver. And the armies were still using Napoleonic tactics from a century previously. <clears throat> what am I talking about? I'm talking about getting people lined up in lines and marching forward. Now, Napoleon or George III didn't have machine guns then, but in 1914, they did. And troops were being mown down on both sides by the thousands and tens of thousands. And rifles in 1914 could kill at a thousand yards. Back during Napoleonic days, they were smoothbore muskets that if you hit somebody at 50 yards, you were lucky. Now you could kill them at 1,000 yards, but they didn't change the tactics. So they ended up digging trenches. And before it was all said and done, trenches literally ran from the North Sea all the way down to the border of Spain. And guys were living in the trenches. And the other thing that they were dealing with was continuous artillery bombardment. And I'm talking about guys being blown literally into atoms. Now, all this was happening. And around December, close to Christmas of 1914, everybody's lying in their trenches. They're thinking about their homes. They're thinking about their families their buddies that had already been killed, and it was just a 
god awful miserable time. Well, something magical happened. The Germans on the German lines who loved the celebration of Christmas, and so did the Brits, by the way, started putting up little Christmas trees with candles for lights. And one evening, they started singing O Christmas Tree, only it was O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum. And if any of you remember, and I was trying to see if we could play this song, uh, during the show, Snoopy's the Christmas. Version. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Where Snoopy goes up in search of the Red Baron once again. And I, by God, it's not Christmas until I hear that song for me. Okay. But anyway, it's reminiscent of what happened. And suddenly, everybody stopped shooting. The Brits started to sing Christmas carols. The Germans were singing Christmas carols. There were still bodies laid out over no man's land, and a truce was called to go out and retrieve the dead. And before you know it, British troops were approaching Germans. Germans were approaching British. They were giving each other little Christmas gifts, like cigarettes or a candy bar, stuff like that, and suddenly the spirit of the season grabbed them all. But it wasn't going unnoticed. The higher-ups on both sides demanded that they get back in their trenches and start shooting again, and they got a somewhat genteel, sir, go fuck yourself, sir, in response. Now, when you think about that in the age of modern warfare, where <clears throat> these two armies had been killing each other by the thousands, for this to happen, oh my God, it, it was beyond belief. A lot, as a matter of fact, a lot of people never even did believe that it actually happened, but there is pictorial evidence of it. Gary? Yeah, I was going to play this for you. Here you go. It's Vince Guaraldi's trio, uh, O'Tenenbaum. between North and South Vietnam, just a few days before Christmas, when I got called back to Quantry, I had a what ended up being a death in the family. I got an emergency leave. But I'll never forget sitting up there and looking out into the dark into North Vietnam and truly wondering, I wonder if I'll be here next year. Oh, you better be. Uh, I'm so glad to have you back in my life. <laughs> I, I want some. I want some time with you, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, Anima, is. Anima, Anima sent me a a note, and she said, "You enjoying your date with my boyfriend?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat says Gary looks like he's got German in him. Uh, hey, Pat, would you like a little German in you? Is <laughs> uh, a little German, a little little tiny German. Uh, uh, Parrothead just says my name for some reason. 
I think he's got I can, I can, I can feel some noggin coming along tonight. Got to get some noggin here. Um, <laughs> I do want to bring up uh, the other truce, which was uh, it. I'm trying to remember what year it took place, but in World War One history, there, there were wolves that became a problem in the trenches, and uh, they called another truce in order to kill wolves. So they would stop injuring and, and killing people. And uh, that's the only other truth. And, and like Don was talking about, it's interesting is that the leadership did not fr- freaking like that. They didn't no. like that Christmas truce. So after that, it's like there were huge artillery barrages every Christmas after that. They would not tolerate that true shit. It's like that is your enemy. You are there to kill them. Uh, and uh, now we oh, never had that problem with the, with the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong or the uh, North Vietnamese. Uh, they, they would, they would call a truce with the South Vietnamese government, but sometimes the word didn't get out to all the VC and NVA units, or they simply didn't well, their give communication a shit. was bad because that's what happened to the Tet Offensive. Uh, the Tet Offensive got all messed up because they weren't communicating correctly, and half of them launched a day early. And yeah. you know about that. That was ground warfare. They were slaughtered. And then the next day, the other offensive took place, the planned one, and it didn't go off. It, it went off with absolute hitches everywhere. And, you know, the big news, oh, they... They got onto the grounds of the U.S. Embassy. Those guys that weren't driven out were killed. Yes. You know. Well, um, they the, the fact that they even were able to get into the embassy was shocking beyond belief. But they were stopped before they could run. Well, they killed some people, sure. And it was basically the Army MPs that basically drove them out. I mean, it was the MPs launching a counteroffensive yeah. against them that killed yep. them. Yep, it was the MPs doing the job. But one of the things I always thought about is like, because um, in World War II, uh, right at the very onset, uh, Billy Mitchell wanted to let Japan know we can touch you. Because they thought they had, you know, did damage enough to where we couldn't touch them. It's like Billy Mitchell showed them, we can still touch you. And I think that was the North Vietnamese attempt to let the U.S. know we can touch you. But the fact is, is they didn't do any damage. They uh, well, they did damage with the media. The media took that and ran with it and made it sound like we lost. That there was this huge defeat. It was de- uh, a depressing incident that hurt and damaged the U.S. Now, the only people that hurt the U.S. was the media. I have never forgiven, and probably before I go, I never will. One of the major media figures in all of American history, Walter Cronkite. What he did, Walter Cronkite. He lied. Basically, yeah. Oh, and tell him, he, tell him about your boss, Dale Dye. What Dale Dye was about. there. At, you know, he was in what is that? Uh, that was um, Way City, right? Saigon. Sa- was it Saigon? Saigon. Okay. Saigon. He was there for that battle. The fight was already over. It was over. And Walter Cronkite is filming on 16 millimeter scubit camera, you know, the hand crank kind, shooting the film and recording analog uh, audio. And there was no fighting going on. That gets sent back to the stateside. And when it got released on television, it had combat sounds added to it. The battle was over. It was very quick. Um, the Tet Offensive was not only uh, stopped, it was quashed. It was completely broken and destroyed. A lot of uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were killed. Huge number. Very few Americans. Um, well, during the, the 68 Tet Offensive, which basically launched January the 30th, the American and Allied troops totally Totally Australians, destroyed. by the way, 
Well, Australians, South Koreans. Yep. Uh, and boy, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> they were some tough babies. Arvin. I, I knew some. No, the 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 Koreans. Oh, okay. this, oh they, shit! I didn't even think about them. They were there. Oh, 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 and and the NVA were scared shitless of the Koreans. But yeah, anyway, they, I, I they dealt with the Japanese. So yeah, they knew. How I to digress. Dish it out. Uh, they they basically had uh, uh, been the Viet Cong. The entire Viet Cong movement had been totally decimated. As a separate Viet Cong military unit, they had nothing else to do the rest of the war. They had been wasted. They were wasted. And it then became an NVA basic war against the, uh, the South and the Americans. Uh, and the NVA wanted it that way. They didn't want the Viet Cong because the NVA were Northerners. The Viet Cong were, for the most part, Southerners. And just like in America, let's say in 1880, there was still a clear divide between the North and the South. Well, that was the same thing in, uh, in Vietnam. So, yeah. Yeah, that was, a, uh, that was a very sad time, let me tell you what. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's another historian friend of mine, uh, T-shirted historian. Um, and uh, this is a subject I would think that he would find very interesting. The truce between the troops. And once again, this was called on the field, right? It was not yeah. ordered by command. It was order, It was decided on the field because of the singing inspired yeah. them to stop. And the little Christmas trees. Ah, oh, the little, the wee little Christmas trees. Um, yeah. There is a movie <clears throat> about this event, and it's called Joyous Noel. And um, let me pull that up real quick here. There it is. Uh, Joyous Noel, Merry Christmas, uh, about the incident, how it happened. It came out in 2014, I think. Oh, no, 2005. 2005 and uh, a relatively unknown cast except for like guys like Gary Lewis Daniel Bruhl who's better known later for work being in the, the MCU uh, let me see if there's any oh Ian Richardson of course we lost him I do believe um, it's it's a very good film I watched it and uh, very historically accurate and, well, uh, let me let me tell you. Let me tell you. In World War One, a number of very mysterious things happened. Did you ever hear about the Angels of Mons? M O N S. No. Look it up right now. Look it up, Gary. The Angels of Mons. This was a battle where the British. A lot of British troops claim they witnessed angelic-type beings coming out of the heavens with swords and spears and landing into the Germans, okay? There it is. There's now, a depiction of ghost warriors up here. Yeah. Now, did it happen? I don't know. I wasn't there. But there was a lot of information about it. Now, something else that happened in uh, the skies of World War I Europe. Now, first off, you got you to gotta realize that the first manned flight in a motorized craft of some type happened in December of 1903 with the Wright brothers down right. at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. <clears throat> First uh, flight was only 58, maybe 59 seconds, 1903. But technology took an immediate leap. 
And by 1914, the armies in Europe were flying aircraft, primarily as reconnaissance vehicles for artillery. They would fly high and above. They'd search out enemy sites that would deserve an artillery barrage. And uh, pretty, excuse me, pretty soon the other side figured that out. So they would send up their airplanes and guys armed with pistols and rifles yep. and start trying to shoot down the other airplanes. Well, yeah, it's a, that it was the that was the birth of the first dogfights. Handheld weapons. <laughs> yeah. So somebody said, well, the hell with that. And they mounted a machine gun on their airplane. And before you knew it, I they mean, were shooting their own planes down because they hadn't figured out the timing and they were destroying the <laughs> propellers. <laughs> they tried to shoot. It was crazy. And then some real aces suddenly popped up. One of them was Baron Manfred von Richthofen. Von Richthofen, Red Baron. Baron. that's right. Snoopy's worst enemy. <laughs> yes, yes. And before long, okay, they were dropping bombs. Do you know the first German blitz of the of the British didn't happen in World War II in 1940? No. It was German Zeppelins flying over to England and dropping bombs on the British. There was a German blitz in, I think it was like 1915, 1916. And you very seldom hear about that. What was that? Scott sent me something. Ah. I had to mute it. Ah. I didn't know it was going to play when I, I clicked to get to like what he sent me. It was, it was Snoopy versus the Red Baron audio. Ah. And I'm like, yep, got to go. Um, so, so anyway, uh, so w let me get back to what I was saying. So here, suddenly, the skies of Europe are filled with warbirds. British, French, German, and then something else very mysteriously happened. One day, a British Sopwith SE aircraft, which was a fighter and a recon aircraft, was flying, I believe it was up around Belgium. I've got the files here. And as the pilot is flying along, his British insignia proudly displayed on his airplane, on his aircraft, he looks off to his side, and here is what appears to be another stop with SE-5. And he looks again, and this pilot with a, with a flying helmet on, but flowing blonde hair, Okay, and it's he's like, what in the hell is that British guy, by the way? Hmm. And he really looks, and the aircraft does not have British insignia on it, but it has the astrological sign of Venus. Suddenly, this pilot pulls her helmet off. He described her as a beautiful blonde woman stood up in the cockpit and shook her butt at him. <laughs> okay. Well, before long, she was known as Lady Sopwith and a lot of pilots claimed to have witnessed her a bit. And she attacked German aircraft. Nobody could figure out who the hell this woman was. Well, number one, they didn't have women pilots in World War I. But then other mysterious craft were sighted in the skies. And before long, reports filtered back from the front that the Germans had their own version of Lady Sopwith, only flying German aircraft, 
attacking British pilots. Now, I don't know. I started doing some research on that lady Sopwith. There's not. There's a little bit up online about her. Well, there's a real lady. She was the hu- uh, the wife. No, nope, uh, it the, wasn't her. It wasn't her. Nope, was not her. Because she was actually no. called Lady Sopwith. Um, her husband was the designer of the Sopwith camel. Yeah. No, it wasn't her. It wasn't and, her. Uh, and to begin with, her husband would have never let her fly an armed yeah. aircraft going into harm's way. This is the lady I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. So this was more of a ghost figure. Uh, yeah. Shaking her ass. That's funny. Yeah. Did a can-can. He described it as doing a can-can. I'll send you that file I have. So you I'd can like take a look that. at it. That's crazy. Lady Sopwith, yeah. But uh, there were UFO. well, what could only have been UFOs that were described in a number of incidents over there in the skies above Europe. And if they were around then, and I'm sure they were because they've been around apparently for thousands of years, they've always been inordinately interested in conflict on the ground. And obviously by this time in the air. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I wanted to talk about, because this took place close to Christmas again between 1916 and 1917 was uh, on the Eastern Front, uh, where the Russians were fighting the Germans, uh, the situation with the wolves got so bad that they were going in and killing and injuring soldiers when they were trying to sleep, guys on guard duty, that the Germans and the Russians called for a truce and worked together to hunt and kill these damn wolves. And they were big Siberian wolves. They weren't like uh, some of them that you see here in the U.S., more like the stuff you see up near the border of Canada and further, where these things weigh uh, upwards of 120 to 200 pounds. And these were capable of dragging a human male adult off in the night. Yeah, that could be that could be a real bitch. You're laying there in your sleeping bag trying to catch 20 winks because you can't catch 40. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and what's written here is, says, the situation grew so severe that the Russian and German soldiers convinced their commanders to allow a temporary truce uh, through negotiations to enable them uh, to deal with the animals more effectively. Once the terms were worked out, the fighting stopped, and the two sides discussed how to resolve the situation. Finally, a coordinated effort was made, and gradually the packs of wolves were rounded up, surrounded, and uh, all of them killed. They, they killed all of the wolves. So none of the wolves in those packs survived. And they got back to doing what they wanted to do, killing each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <clears throat> then something else happened. Okay. Uh-oh, uh-oh. The Bolsheviks, the commies in Russia, headed by people like Vladimir Lenin, and the guy that became Joseph Stalin overthrew the czar, the czarina, and children, and murdered ultimately them. murdered them. Okay. Yep. And the Bolsheviks took over, and then a civil war was ignited in what had formerly been czarist Russia, and it was brutal. As a matter of fact, the Americans and the Brits when World War I was, was concluded in November of 1918, got involved in that. America sent troops to the Arctic to fight the Bolsheviks on behalf of the white Russians opposing the Reds, all right? Uh, the first real fight. Now, that had consequences that led all the way in Great Britain to this day. What the hell are you talking about, Ecker? Well, I'm going to tell you. At the end of the war, World War I, there were revolutions all across Europe. 
the communists were on the march. Eventually, the Reds won the and became the Soviet Union, won the Tsarist or the Russian uh, revolutions were concluded successfully by the Bolsheviks. And suddenly, Germany was in the midst of a revolution, which against the Reds, which caused the rise of the Nazi party. And Britain was looking at all these hundreds of thousands of trained and veteran combat troops coming back to the UK armed and no freaking jobs. And the British were scared to death of the possibility of a revolution in the UK. Were you aware of that, Gary? Yeah, well, I know that in the United States, as well as during the Depression, the United States uh, and the UK both, uh, there was a big fear that uh, with the depressed economy that the communists could get a foothold in both countries. Well, what that led to was the British back in the early 20s beginning to outlaw, outlaw, make criminals, anybody that privately owned firearms. Yeah. They began to disarm the British populace, okay? Disarm them. Take away their guns. Well, that kind of backfired on them after 1939. This is something, and I, I've talked to Brits about this over the years. Uh, and, you know, initially they thought I was full of shit until they did a little background on it. Like a Christmas goose? Yes. Cool. <laughs> a Christmas as full of shit as a Christmas turkey. So, Winston Churchill, by now, was the prime minister. They got rid of that pussy Neville Chamberlain, that useless as tits on a boar hog prime minister that had been there before Churchill, who had basically given Czechoslovakia to the Krauts, to the Nazis, and uh, a lot of other really foul ups. And Churchill was taking a look. The Germans overran France. Dunkirk happened, and it was a miracle that the Brits were able to evacuate their army back to the UK. A miracle, which only happened because so many civilians took their own craft over there to ferry back British troops. And if the Brits were able to keep their rifles, they were in good shape because everything else went the way of the dodo bird. They lost artillery, trucks, vehicles, tanks, you name it, the British lost it. Now they're looking at the possibility of a German invasion of the UK. It was a very real possibility. So Churchill called up his buddy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he said, Mr. President, he said, we're really in a bad, bad way. And uh, we need weapons. Anything, everything you can you can basically give us. Well, yeah. that was one of the, the reasons that Roosevelt basically signed that treaty with them and gave them old World War I destroyers. Everybody's heard about that. But he went to... Roosevelt went to the American public and he said, look, our friends in England need small arms. If you can donate a rifle, a shotgun, a pistol, anything, we're going to send them to the British because they need them. And people began giving personal firearms to the government to give to the Brits. And basically, thank God, the Germans never did invade. But they had home guard troops out in the fields armed with pitchforks because they didn't have yeah. a shotgun yep. to, to basically impale German paratroopers 
if the Germans jumped into the UK. That's always so been a fear of Britain, though, is because, um, you know, with all the bombing that came with World War II was the constant fear of an invasion by yes. Germany, you know. And uh, so a lot mm. of the citizenry were, were well armed by World War II, um, mostly with uh, rifles and shotguns. Uh, and uh, that's living in a country like England. It's like it's a very small state com in comparison physically. It looks it's it's like uh, it's smaller than Texas, and it's it's a fucking country, you know. And they're surrounded on all sides by water, and they could be invaded at any time. Which is why I do believe one of the best navies of World War II, it, it, even possibly World War One, was Britain's navy. Oh well, the Royal Navy basically was the British Shield. Yeah, because it was the only thing to stop that invasion. You know, because that was one of their greatest fears of being invaded. The U.S., it was a more passive invasion, which was we had Nazis here. We had communists. Uh, and they weren't very dissimilar, if you remember, some of their ways of wanting to do things. Disarm uh, civilians and enact a socialist program. And uh, well, they're still trying it right now. Yep. Actively doing it right now. We have people in office right now trying to do this shit uh scary stuff man and uh the only thing that they're the mo the thing that they're most terrified of in this country is the midwest because from north to texas people are fucking armed in this country in the middle and they won't put up with that hmm. shit so the east coast and the west coast they're, they're more, more susceptible to anybody well, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, okay, no, yeah, they're good. Deer yeah. season, deer season, in usually in December, after the first snows, uh, it sounds like the second battle of the bulge <laughs> up in those mountains. Everybody's got their deer rifle or their shotgun, and uh, they. Well, of course, I haven't been there in a long time. I don't know what it's like today. But uh, when I when I moved from Pennsylvania after I came back from Vietnam and I moved out west, it was still like that. Yeah, everybody hunted, and it's the one thing that scares people. Red Dawn kind of talked about that. Uh, I love that movie, the original, not the crappy new one. But I wanted to go to our chat here because I haven't gotten to say hello to everybody yet. I will before the end yeah, of the sure. show. But um, we got some comments here that I thought were interesting. T-shirt said uh, it's notable that uh, during the Thirty Years' War, wolves and wild boars grew in huge numbers and ravaged Saxony and the surrounding lands because of the carnage and ease of prey. Very true, very true, my friend. Uh, let's see. I, I've. And this is John Ostend, your friend. Uh, I've long thought there shouldn't be a world war one world war two more like one great war with a brief armistice it's well, really what it was because it's the it's armistice true. that led to world war two uh we've talked about you and i've talked about that on other shows that you know it's because they excluded us from the um the the final meetings to to design this armistice and tr and treaty and the well French let me let me British... just pop in let me pop in here real quick about that yeah the French were vicious and vile about the Germans, and with some with some reason. Oh, I mean, they I'm, have I'm, reason. They absolutely have a reason. Yeah. But they wanted not only their pound of flesh, they wanted 50 pounds of flesh. And if you get right down to it, so did the Brits. And they basically caused the rise no, of the Nazi rise of Party. Yeah, there would have been no Hitler if they hadn't done what they did. Um, and it's it's always such a, a, a warning. People go, well, what does history give us? History teaches you a fucking lesson. If you pay attention, you learn from it. Uh, stop trying to rewrite history because if you rewrite history, you might miss a great point. Uh, but anyway, um, let's see. Uh, if only the nobles would have killed Rasputin the year before Red October, the Tsars might have beat the Reds. Um, that's interesting. I don't know. 
uh that would be we should talk about that sometime i'd like to look do some research on that uh damn man uh t-shirt says even now the government keeps close eyes on all military veterans who are, yeah i got sick of that during the previous administration of calling american veterans uh, a threat to national security well, I went ballistic back in those days. It was during the Obama administration. Was that the okay. administration? <laughs> yes, that was the one. And she. this was when there was a lot of grief over that military uh, psychiatrist that was Muslim. That Oh, shot yeah, the a, Texas, Texas, yeah. Down in Fort Houston, okay. Yeah. And then she hit. I'm trying to think of what what the woman's name was now. She basically sent a letter out to all the Leos around the country, law enforcement oh. organizations. Oh, that's it. We got to go to commercial break. We'll finish. We're going to go to commercial break. Take over, Chanel. I like the way she does this. Hi guys, this is Gary from Pop Culture Minefield here on KGRA, and we're leaving for our first break. I hope we survive. Hey members, the new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on-demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. Behind every folded flag is a family. When American lives are lost in defense of our freedom, TAPS is there to help the friends and families of those who have served and died. TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. We provide help, hope, and healing every day. Visit us online at TAPS.org or call 1-800-959-TAPS. Are you looking to go on a faraway journey that is magical and mysterious, reaping on mystical legends? If so, then Mysterious Adventure Tours is perfect for you. Imagine a voyage to explore ancient mysteries of Ireland, haunted majesties of Scotland, or their chilling birth of the vampires in Romania. These small esoteric getaways are limited and do fill up fast. So, go to MysteriousAdventureTours.com and book your trip soon. You're listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. We provide unparalleled coverage of trending news in the world of ufology, cryptozoology, and paranormal phenomenon. Whether you're watching our video live stream or listening to one of our audio programs, you are getting the best from world-renowned researchers and hosts guiding you through topics the mainstream won't touch. Miss one of your favorite programs? No problem. Head over to the members area at KGRADB.com for access to our massive library of award-winning content. Make contact, stay connected, only at KGRADB.com. Oh, wow, we survived. Welcome back to the commercial break. Now for some more pop culture minefield on KGRA. My my favorite Christmas thing to say is, yippee ki motherfucker. Anyway. Um, oh, so crude. Can I finish my story now? Yes, please do. What story was I telling? Fuck if I remember. I was like, I wanted to say, if you can't remember yet, let me do this. Uh, Chanel, would you pop up here? I want to introduce you to everybody. Come on, Chanel. Chanel, is she, there she is. Yes. Me off guard here. Yeah, do you mind popping up? This is Chanel, guys. This is the girl that runs our show. And I just wanted you guys to see her. Woman. So you this is the her. woman, not gal, not girl, woman. This Normally, is the woman. The military. I had my ass chewed for that once. Um, <laughs> Normally, I actually say female because the military te- taught me to not ever say the, anything else. Just refer to the female. But Speaking the of, is, did you, you hear this the lady? This girl is an amazing singer. 
Oh, I'm going to tell you. Did you hear the latest? Did I or did The you? Marine Corps. The Marine Corps. The United States Marine Corps is having a debate today, today. about doing away with yes, sir, yes, ma'am, because it's oh. gender inequality. The United States freaking Marines. I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> but hey, Shin, I want to let you know we appreciate you. You do an amazing job running the show. And uh, I just wanted to introduce you to all the jerks that watch the show. Well, you know they're jerks because they like Don and me. <laughs> thank you guys for uh, having me on and for letting me produce the show. And oh, oh it's hey. It's an honor. It's an honor. Janelle, you here. you've been doing and we need to get one of your songs. great service. Great well, service. We got to get some of your music on here if your band will say okay. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be thrilled. Outstanding. And she she is an amazing singer. I like her stuff. I follow her on what is that? Not TikTok. Is it TikTok? It's uh, we have an Instagram at Instagram Kitchen underscore official underscore band. I went and listened to like 15 of your songs like in one afternoon. I'm like, this stuff is good. Well, gee, <laughs> thanks. I appreciate it. Which that. which tells you Gary doesn't have much of a life. I have no life. <laughs> I have That's zero right. life. Uh, I in radio. <laughs> it's basically at night they turn the light off on the garage and I just stay in here. <laughs> cold wondering you know i'm hoping that they'll turn the lights on eventually again in the morning R remember i exist <laughs> but uh thanks again chanel i'm sorry i bugged you no, i just, no. I just wanted to introduce you it was a real treat it was nice to meet everybody all right hey chanel <laughs> chanel darling have a wonderful christmas oh i hope you have one too well thank you very much and merry christmas to the both of you as well i'm jewish no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, even if I was, I mean, the Jewish side of my family, they all celebrate Christmas. They all do. Uh, they love the holidays. Uh, I do want to go do back. They, to the they bring in the house, uh, uh, Hanukkah bush. Although with my brother, Michael, because he went through this whole Hasidic period. Uh, at Christmas time, he would be sitting at the table and I would lord the ham. I'm like, it's mine, Michael. I get all this. <laughs> God, That's I miss him. You're you're a genuine dick, Gary. Come I'm on. a dick. It's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> All right. Real Wave Nation says, "Hey, Gary, I got to recommend the Korean War film uh, called A Sun Rising Dragon." Um, I have not heard of that one. I'm going to check it out. I'm assuming. Hey, it's Gary, am I chopped liver? Am I chopped liver or what? You you're not chopped liver, but your name, for some reason, Real Wade Nation says Gary and not Don, for some reason. Gary so, and Don. Gary and Don. So what's That's up with cool. that, Real Wade Nation? You got something? You got a beef with Don? Ah? <laughs> <laughs> we got um, Saul Assassin saying, I remember hearing the mob talking like this. Hey, that there, yeah. Ah, forget about it. Um, the mob <laughs> chased, they did, they fought the Nazis because despite being criminals, they love this country. They love America, you know, and a lot of, a lot of mobsters served. Uh, they even talk about that with, uh, the Godfather, you know, in the movie, the Godfather. They got lucky Luciano out of prison to, uh, clean up the docks. That's right. To clean up, get the Nazis and the commies out of the docks. That was Lucky Luciano. Uh, hey, capish. What was it that nun used to say to me before she hit me? Um, uh, Testerora, escuch. <laughs> Bap. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it supposedly means something like uh, listen up, lunkhead or knucklehead. <laughs> I was an idiot. Uh, and Eastland Burkholder uh, said the Nazi risk was overlooked because the left was more feared. And I got to tell you, that's true, which is odd because Nazis are leftists, too. <clears throat> yes, they are. They followed the same program. Uh, everything that they did in Nazi Germany was based off of what Stalin did and Lenin. And uh, Stalin. National a... Socialist Party. That's right. That was the operative word socialist. Yep. Socialist. Uh, and I always tell people don't forget, the USSR doesn't have communists in it. It says Soviet Socialist Republic. 
Socialism is the democratically elected uh, form of what will become um, communism. It, socialism is soft, and then it, it's the doormat. You open the door, you walk through. Oh, communism, how you doing? Uh, so there you have it. Uh, thank you, Eastland. Thank you very much. And, of course, Zach's our good, my good friend. Uh, when the Americans were excluded from the go- negotiations, I just I read ahead. <laughs> you should You should have said, nice place you got here. Maybe we'll stick around. That's right. It's what we should have done, but it's what they wasn't done. Um, it, it's embarrassing what we allowed to happen. Because even though um, we were kept from the table in Versailles, we should have forced our way in that door. If we'd had a stronger president, we would have. Uh, our president failed... The, failed the world, really. Failed don't the world. forget, Gary. Don't forget that Wilson had a stroke or some bullshit. Oh, and his it's wife. Believed yeah, his wife, his wife was was operating the machinery behind the scenes. Yep, she was the the man behind the curtain. It's true, uh, and actually, I do believe that to be pretty factual of what happened. That he was laid up and couldn't lead anymore, and she. Did all of the stuff and backdoor, yeah, backdoor. I just said it, backdoor deals, stuff like that. Yeah, I know. I kind of makes you wonder who's running the machinery now, doesn't it? Yeah, strong. I'm gonna go check the back door. (laughs) (laughs) Back door. I don't know that that tickles me. Um, but get back to the uh, the show here. What were we talking about? What were you talking about before we went to break? Uh, It was, um, I know that part of it you were talking about, uh, and I wanted to bring this up. That's right, because Peaky Blinders talks about that, how the British, uh, they got rid of the the soft dude that was, like, uh, not fighting the Nazis, and we brought in... Uh, Chamberlain. Yeah, Chamberlain. What a piece of shit he was. And uh, But Peaky Blinders talks about that potential invasion all the way back before World War II. I mean, after World War One and before World War II, uh, where he, the mobster, uh, th- was spying on the commies and the Nazis both for, um, what's his name with cigar? Um, uh, Churchill? Churchill. Churchill, thank Churchill. you. He was working directly for Winston Churchill in the show, and I like that they did that, even though it's not totally true. Um, it showed how organized crime did its job for God and country every once in a while not just in the U S but also in the UK uh, because they didn't like communists and they didn't like um, uh, Nazis either. So they show that in that series. The Brits in the last 40 years. uh, And I'm talking about the official establishment for the most part, not entirely because Maggie Thatcher was a fly in the buttermilk, but they've been very soft on socialism. Yeah, I, I can't remember, because I know uh, Churchill was against it, the National Health Program, and it was a socialist uh, that worked within the government who fought for it, and he got the votes. And that's, it was 1947 when the, um, the same year as Roswell. <laughs> that's when- Is uh, there a connection? I think there is. No, it's there clearly no connection, but- um, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting that in 47, you know, the socialists got a hook in, into the government there in Britain and people were tired. It was, it had been a rough war for Britain. I mean, we got it rough, but nothing compared to what happened. in. Oh, Britain. They, they were still rationing up until the fifties. It was, it was terrible. Uh, their unexploded bombs, uh, everything just that country was a mess. And Churchill was trying to pull it together, and the socialists they voted like, him out. They voted him out, and they put a guy in that brought forth the National Health Program, uh, which is a socialist program. And and I got to tell you, social programs can work, but you have to have a healthy economy for them to work. Social I, security, is a social program. Yeah. It's like social programs can work as long as you have a healthy pro, uh, uh, economy. And it's the cheese wheel. I always bring up the cheese wheel. Uh, if you lay out a cheese wheel and go, tell everybody, everybody gets to eat from this. Everybody gets the bite. 
eventually you whittle it down. What do you do next once that wheel is gone? If you don't have a strong economy or a factory to build the cheese or make build the cheese, make more cheese. Well, you know, I got a mechanic that's going to make some of that there cheese. Um, you don't get any more cheese wheels. And then you end up in a down life and people start starving to death. And the only people who don't starve to death are the higher echelon. And that's the thing about communism is there's a tier system. And those that are at the top never suffer. It's all those below. Uh, and it's, uh, it, you know, they talk shit about, uh, you know, uh, Reagan's trickle down program. The trickle down program works exactly the way communism works. It's just built off of a strong economy rather than off of socialism. It's the only difference. And uh, so when I hear a lefty talking shit about trickle down, I'm like, well, how does yours work? <laughs> it's trickle down. Oh, oh, okay. Where's that trickle down coming from? Now, agreed, I don't think Reagan's worked as well as it should have. But, uh, you know, I got to be honest. I don't, I don't, I think that every American should have a right to work towards what they can get. Um, I love that about our country, and it's why I hate socialism. Is because look, I can tell you about get social, rich off of writing. social medicine yeah. at the Veterans Administration. That is social medicine. Yep, that's a social program. It, and uh, great example. Because I've told I, people, I, if you want to see how it doesn't work, look at the VA. The VA is a microcosm of national health system. And if you exactly. can't get it to work for just a handful of veterans, how the fuck do you think you're going to get it to work for everybody? One thing, stop paying politicians so much money and giving them a retirement. Tell them you're in there for so many years and then get the fuck out and go back to your job. Don't make your fortune off of working in the government. That's one well, good people way like, money. Look, people like, uh, well, I'm not going to name names because... If I do that, I'm liable to cause problems. But the politicians, we have an entire class of political, quote, unquote, leaders, okay? And incidentally, they should go back and reread the Constitution because they're not leaders. They work for I, for me and you. They're, okay? so, they're, they're nothing more than civil servants. That's right. They're civil servants. And that's but all we are. have a whole class that have never had a job except their political position. Yep. A whole class of them. There, there should and be no such thing as a political career. Think about that. How why does that exist? You know, it mess. used to be the American military. We did not have professional soldiers. A handful. Okay. Yep. Like Marine Corps, you know, uh, guards at embassies, that type of thing. But uh, uh, it used to be a civilian volunteer military. Of course, we can't do that today. And we now we do have a professional class. But the danger has always been, as I see it, and I watched it for a long time, the military has become a grand social experiment. It's so like a few months ago at the Air Force Academy, they were trying to convince the cadets. Well, I, I could get off on a rant here. I don't want to, but this gender inequality horse shit. Look, the military is to do two things, okay? At its finest essence boiled down, the military was designed to break things and kill people, period. That's what they do. That's what they're supposed to do. And it's not like that today. Now, that may sound brutal to anybody that's never either been in the armed forces or had family, but uh, what do you think happened in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812? the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, etc. They kill people. They break things. That's what they do. And that's what enables us today to still be living the life that we're living now here. 
I think I think that would qualify as a rant, Gary. Okay, I did my rant for the day. It's a little one. I, I would say I would call that one of your minor rants. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it, basically, you know, we've gone over this. It, it's like um, I, I love uh, referring to what we do as ADD theater because we're very stream of conscious, and people who don't know what that's like. Um, we think visually, you and I think visually, and we think in a constant stream. It's a flow. And that flow can, like, just like with water, when it hits dirt, you don't know what direction it's going to go. You can dig a, a, dig a trowel and guide it. But sometimes it'll overflow and go in different directions. And uh, so I like that. I like the way we think. I like the way we do shows. And um, we have that. It's like, wow, that connects to this. Which leads me back to a favorite show of mine as a child. And I don't know if you remember, you were, you were in your probably 20s when it came out, um, early 20s, called Connections. Did you ever watch hmm. that show? It was on PBS from no. England. It was from England. Uh, and it was one of my favorite shows that the beginning of the show would talk about this technology or this science. And it goes... And but if you go back all the way to here, 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago was the very first step towards this thing now. And he would connect it. And I love that show. And uh, and so that's sort of how my brain works. And I think yours works the same way. It's like there's all these connections because everything leads. I mean, your whole discussion today went all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars to talk about how things ended up the way they were uh, on that day or during the, the truce, the Christmas truce, and how things were handled in that war. Uh, Napoleonic warfare, you know. Uh, Napoleon also started something else. It failed the first time out was canned food. Yes. Because they were trying to get food uh, by train to the soldiers in the front uh, against Russia. And they were sealing it with lead. Yep, that was the problem, and it failed. Uh, but it if it weren't for the Napoleonic Wars, it might have taken longer to, to find canned food. To discover well, you know, food, speak, speaking very briefly, going back to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, one of the finest series I've ever watched, and I, I have it uh, today, I, I have it stored, is a British series about the Napoleonic Wars called Sharps Rifles. That was yes. the first episode. And it goes on from there. And my God, is that is that a fascinating look at history. Thrilling. And uh, uh, he was quite a rake with a number of ladies, by the way. So uh, Not surprised. no political correctness there. And uh, and oddly, one of the few roles that was played by uh, Sean Bean, where he didn't die. Yes, yes, <laughs> came close a couple of times. Yeah, I love that show. It's a good show. Um, uh, it was a, a series of movies. I, I shouldn't call it a show. It's a series of movies. Uh, it was also like uh, Gifford, uh, Gifford, whatever his name is, that played uh, Reed Richards in the Fantastic Four films earlier in the early two thousands. Um, he played the part of the great. Um, uh, s naval book character that George Lucas was inspired by, um, Horatio Hornblower. Horatio Hornblower. He did several movies. Uh, I really enjoyed him as Horatio Hornblower. What a great series of films. Um, well, you know, the Peninsular Campaign during the Napoleonic Wars, where Wellington, Lord Wellington, ended up being a lord, uh, Wellington were fighting the. Uh, the French and their Spanish, the French had Spanish allies and Portuguese, etc. ad nauseum, trying to work their way up to France. A lot of those peninsular veterans, and they were a tough bunch, boy. They were tough. Ended up at New Orleans, were invading the United States. Okay, right. those guys. And they were being led by a general by the name of Packingham, who was also a Peninsular veteran. 
And, you know, when, when they were making their assault on Andy Jackson's lines, all right, Packingham was riding his horse forward with the troops, which to me, that was this the, the one of the dumbest things you could do. And he ended up with something like 40 or 50 musket balls in him. <laughs> Needless to say, he, he did not survive. But, uh, man, that was asking to get your ass shot off. Here I am. Shoot, shoot. And they did. Um, hey, this one's to you. Uh, hey, Don, thanks for hosting these shows over here on Pop Culture Mindfield and KGRA. And I guess Gary, too. Shut up, John. <laughs> <laughs> and then Paradise says, Don's cooler. <laughs> uh, I will go back here. This one uh, is from Krampus Sheebus. You walk through the back door. And, oh, hi, communism. So, yeah, you, you broke it. So here it is. Like, wouldn't you know that back door would trigger a trap door? There we go. All right. Uh, back to the comments. Um, uh, Bush McFadden says, hey, Jeeves, keep it up. Uh, Krampus. Oh, here we go. Uh, the VA has had tons of complaints for a very long time. Two of my cousins and an uncle served in Vietnam. The problem is the same thing with the national health system is not the treatment but how long it takes to get the treatment. And you got guys that are dying, waiting. <laughs> People well, die you know, while waiting. If you, if you basically deal with the system for any length of time, okay? Right. You're going to discover that many of those people within the system, and this is previously. Now, I got to say, in the last 10, 15 years, I have few complaints about the level of treatment that I have received as a combat wounded veteran. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> like my, my, currently my, my primary care doctor that I see when I go in, uh, the guy has been a freaking saint. He really has. But now I'm going to tell you a little story about right after I came back. Now, I had been wounded on Easter Sunday. And as a matter of fact, uh, we probably have new listeners here. I died during surgery. I was dead as a doornail. And obviously, they revived me. And uh, here I am, okay? but I Unless had, this had is really, hell. Yeah, it could be. There's a possibility there, Gary. Hanging out with me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I I when I got home, okay, I was still suffering uh, a lot of effects. I had been hit in the chest. I had a had a bullet in my chest. I had been hit in the back and the and the uh, through both my hands with shrapnel. And uh, one morning, I had to go into the bathroom, and when I got done and I took a look. The toilet was filled with blood, and I knew I had to go back in the VA, so I did. I went down to uh, my local VA. Uh, they basically admitted me, and they told me, now, this might be TMI for a lot of you guys, too much information, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, they told me they had to go up inside me and take a look, all right? Proctoscope. If you don't know what a proctoscope is, hey, Check it out. So would you well, say that they went up the back door? Open your back door, baby. <laughs> they did in a big way. <laughs> so <clears throat> they they had me in there for about four days, and I went from solid food to broth to no food, constant enemas, and then they were going to do this exam. So I get into the room with this doctor. Now, this guy looked like he was an intern during the Spanish-American War, which was even before the Boxer Rebellion. He was a smoker. Okay, now, this, this is funny in hindsight. You know, the guy smoked like a chimney. So I got in there, and they had me get on all fours, and he took that proctoscope, 
And honest to God, now this is going to sound gross, but I thought he was doing bayonet practice. And he rammed it into me, and it was beyond excruciating. I screamed, okay, because the guy had no bedside manner at all. And literally, it hurt so bad, tears were streaming out of my eyes. And I jerked over, and I yelled, and I looked at this guy. Now, this man will never realize how close he came to sudden death. And believe me, I was fresh out of the fucking jungle then. And I didn't yet have a total control on all my impulses after just coming back from that war. He looked at me and he said, suck it up, be a man. And that's when he almost met his doom. And that nurse could see it. And she put her arm around my shoulder and kind of gave me a little hug and a squeeze, which was the only thing that stopped me from landing on that guy like a Rottweiler with a T-bone, okay? Yeah. And Gary, I'm dead serious. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. Um, and I know how those guys, they, they, they really, what's, what's that called? Uh, Self-awareness. It's the lack of situational awareness. That's what I'm looking for. Situational awareness. You'll have these doctors that lack situational awareness of who they're dealing with. And they really need to read people. They don't know how to read people. A lot of doctors I've known don't know how to read people. And they, I, I came close to Dak and the doctor once when he said the wrong thing to me. And I sat there and I contemplated, uh, is it worth going to jail for you? I really, and it's the only reason I didn't hit him. It's because I'm like, no, nope, my kid needs me. Um, I, I can't punch him. So I get it. And this guy's talking shit to you with, with a combat wound. Fuck that guy. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got some really good comments here in the chat. I, I'm really trying to get caught up on them. I miss having Martin here. Who gets married on a Wednesday? <laughs> Nobody. Martin's at a wedding today. That's why he's not here today, guys. Um, like, and, he, and what's funny is that's actually a line of dialogue in the first episode with Harrison Ford of 1923. Because they're asking the kid, it's like, why is your why, why, you know, uh, fiance are angry at you? And he goes, well, you know, because I'm going to be out here doing the, the, the thing here with you guys. When the wedding's supposed to take place, he goes, "What day? What day were you planning the wedding?" And he's like, "On Wednesday." And Harrison Ford goes, "Who the hell order uh, does a wedding on Wednesday? <laughs> That's just crazy." <laughs> <laughs> and then the first thing Martin says, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" I quoted Harrison Ford. I'm like, "Yeah, who fucking gets married on a Wednesday? What a weird day. It's cheaper. Uh, it's like." Look, man, you live in Mexico. How much more cheap do you need a wedding to be? Like, is that French? Yes, it is. Who in the hell reads French? Uh, um, forget, I know some of the words. getting married on a Wednesday. Pas matridans, tomason, quon, nu, yo, soms. That's all I know. I don't even know what it means, so I. Yeah, I don't know. I know one of them means, uh, I think, mother. Matra uh, is mother, I think, in French. But anyway, uh, I, well, we have somebody in the chat right now who can translate it for us. This is Anima. She speaks French. Uh, so let's see. Parlez-vous français? Uh, and, of course, Knight Rider is clearly, I think, Canadian, French-Canadian. Okay. Le Croix. Yeah, I know that one. The Cross. Okay. Uh, I speak and read French, Lord Thoth says. Um, I always love Steve Martin <laughs> when he says, when you, it, to speak French correctly, you should sound like you're choking to death. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, he says, he says something in French and then he de steps to the side like he's somebody else. Someone save that man. He's speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> um uh okay so they translate it for him okay you are 
You are not the boss in your house when you are there. Is what okay. Okay. So the matra means boss, I guess. Like a matra D in a restaurant. I get it. Okay. Uh, so I want to go to some of the starred comments. Uh, das Wolfen says, some of us are such jerks that we end up showing up on the shows with Don and Gary. It's true. Um, fascism was born in Italy. Yeah. Uh, Don, have you heard about the safe space on naval ships? Oh, my God. Get the fuck <laughs> out of here. What? <laughs> oh, God. I'm so tired of sa- the word safe space. <laughs> They, they uh, needed that at Pearl Harbor in December. Yeah, 7th, I know. 41. I'm sorry, Japanese. You can't bomb here. This is a safe <laughs> space. That's how safe spaces don't work. Um, when the draft ended, John O'Stein says this, when the draft ended, the military class began on the backs of the poor. I can't argue that. What I will tell you, though, is, and I brought this up before, Generation Kill it refers to the volunteer era of the military because when you have the draft, you have a larger number of people with weapons that will not actually aim them at another human being and fire. Um, they, they ranked it as low as um, 11 to 15% at one point during. Well, World let me, let me World tell you what, when Richard Milhouse Nixon, and you and I have discussed this before. Oh, it was a mistake what he did. I agree. When he did away with the military draft to appease the left, at that moment that I heard about it, I said to whoever it was I was with, you know what? We're fucked. We've got problems. I mean, Harvey Keitel is one of the few Hollywood celebrities that says selective services needs to be brought back. And I don't care if you serve in the military. You need to serve this country in some fashion right out of high school, two years minimum. Um, many countries overseas in Europe do it. It's it's mandatory service to your country. I don't care if it's uh, helping the needy or uh, serving in the, the, the um, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol. <laughs> Picking up trash by the roadside. Yeah, do something. Whatever. But I make fun. Make fun, I always make fun of the Civil Air Patrol because uh, my, Zoe's mother, uh, my ex-wife, said she was she was when she was in high school she was Civil Air Patrol, and I said, "Is there an uncivil Air Patrol? Because <laughs> if you have one, <laughs> should you have the other?" <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Anyway, uh, Krampus says. Um, they should make military service mandatory if you're a politician. Uh, I don't think you should be able to serve in office unless you have served this country in some fashion. Uh, sacrifice for your country in some way. Uh, a civilian shouldn't be in charge of the earned uh, armed forces. So you exactly. I know where you're going with that, Jeebus. You're absolutely, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, if you're going to be a command or possibly even supreme commander, uh, I think you better have had some service behind you. But uh, the American the American Republic is founded on, on freedom control. and liberty. Yep. So civilian control Bush, of the military, which is why Starship Troopers, as neat an idea as that is, uh, Heinlein should know better than to say that because uh, this country isn't run by the government; it's run by the people. Uh, Bush Bush McFadden says. Quote, service guarantee citizen, another reference to Starship Troopers. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there, there, there is a certain appeal to what Heinlein proposed. Yes, especially for, for those of us who have served. For those yes. of us who have served, we get kind of annoyed with you motherfuckers that didn't serve that, um, you know, you start talking shit and it's like, well, you know, it's a really nice game to talk, but, you know, have you ever been willing to back it up? Because that's what every single veteran, especially those of us that served infantry, you know, we we were willing to back it up. And, uh, and that's why I tell people, if you serve, you learn to respect things better. And that's why you will find almost the best, not always, but almost always the best police officers are guys with prior service in the military. Tell me I'm wrong, Don. 
No, that's true. Absolutely. Some of the best policemen I know personally in my life <laughs> served the military. And I'm not saying that some of my friends that are cops that didn't serve are bad cops. I'm just saying that the ones that served are better cops. <laughs> I know I just terrible what I just said. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 back in those, in those days, when I first became a police officer in 74, uh, a lot of guys, well, you, you got to remember Vietnam, basically the whole experience started in 61. Everybody thinks it started in 65, 66, when LBJ sent the Marines over there. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the 101 and all that. No, no, actually military advisors were there in 61 and it led on up through 75. So and that's that, what that the Green Berets was about, wasn't it? It was that early yeah. incursion. Yeah. Because we're yeah. there as advisors only, uh, supposedly. <laughs> well, there, believe me, there was a lot of trigger time, Gary. There was Oh, a I don't doubt it. Time. And I tell people all the time, you know, I said, one thing you got to remember about the Special Forces, Green Berets are actually referred to as the diplomats of the U.S. Army. They're, they're primary, trainers. They're trainers. They're there to uh, create a relationship between the military and a local community. And that's why a lot of times in order to be in the Green Berets, you have to be uh, multilingual. Now, the real ass kickers and boy, Door I'm going to piss. I'm going to piss some people off when I say this. Uh oh. The real ass kickers and no Navy SEALs. I'm not slighting you. No gyrenes, I'm not slighting you, but it's the freaking airborne rangers. They are some bad mofos. Yep. By the way, you just said a word that uh, I, from what I understood, gyrene came from Guadalcanal, right? Yeah. But I can't remember why they were called that. Um, I'm not having been one, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but it's funny you said that because... I've referred to that as being one in Marine friends when I go, Jirene. And I go, yeah, I, I, I read that in books, uh, yeah. them being called Jirenes. And it started, as I recall, in Guadalcanal. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bush McFadden, I agree, Krampus, and they should have their own income. Let's go full Roman with these bastards. I, I can't argue with some of these statements. I really can't. Uh, no, you can be a citizen, but not making political decisions. You can vote. That's the problem, though, is voting is part of your right as a citizen, the right to vote. Uh, and that's and how where, many don't? How many don't? Or worse, uh, as uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone said, it's okay not to know politics and not vote. It's okay. You don't have to vote because there are stupid people out there that wield a vote the same way an idiot would wield a gun, you know, and do damage. Uh, it's go ahead, stay home, don't vote. Uh, Krampus says, no, you can be a citizen, but no making political decisions. I, again, Liberty is, is a funny creature, man. Funny creature. Um, love the sharp series. Someone should review them. Are you referring to you or me, Zax? Or are you trying to say we should team up? Uh, cause I wouldn't mind doing that. I'd love to have you on. Um, let's see. Lord Thoth says all hail Lord Thoth. As a veteran, the VA is awful. Overloaded, overworked, and underfunded. They got great personnel. I worked in the VA up in Washington, and I hated the, the way the system worked. Uh, I hated watching these guys, and I'm like, that could be me one day. Uh, fuck, man. Fuck that shit. Um, the primary care I had was a little Jewish guy with a sense of humor. He was great. All the major doctors I ever got treated by were, were um, Korean. And one of them was, um, he was Filipino. He was Filipino. I'm sorry, not Korean. Um, his name was Dr. Philip Nile. And he was one of our main ER guys. I told you a story of the um, coat glass in the guy's asshole. Dr. Philip Nile, a.k.a. on his business card, Dr. P. Nile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you're great, man. This fucking guy rocks. Primary care I had a, is, yeah, read that one. Let's go ahead uh, move to the next one. Oh, yes, because you died, you are zombie done. That's right. 
Uh, I died twice as an infant, so technically I am a zombie. Um, so I get it. Um, we got that one. And here we go. Another good one. VA care should be factored into a true cost of war. Absolutely. Uh, and I get mad when citizens don't want to take the responsibility for your veterans. That's who's responsible for veterans is the citizenry. Because you do not want the Department of Defense being put in charge of your fucking recovery. They know how to make killers. They don't know how to unmake them. They no, don't know how to fix them true. when they break them. That has been a truism since day number one. Yep. Uh, they taught me how to kill with a rifle, a pistol, a knife, my hands. Okay. And they put me in a place where all those things had to be utilized. And when I came home, I came home. I, I don't want to sound like, I'm, you know. But I came home a bloody mess, and nobody ever defused me. I had to defuse myself. Yeah, and that's the thing that sucks. You know, Hollywood talks a good game, but Hollywood is a, a place where they could put a lot of money into helping veterans, and they still don't do it, in my opinion. You know, this this is okay. I'm going to go on another mini rant, Gary. God damn it, I am. <laughs> How because short this is this is one? Two with... feet? Three feet? <laughs> no, this this is not huge. But you know, in in uh, seventy two when I came back, uh, a lot of people I knew before going, people I played ball with, football, baseball, you know, they avoided me like the plague, like I had some kind of infectious disease when I came back from Vietnam. And I dealt with that all through the 70s and a lot of entertainment back then. Television and some movies did what? They portrayed the Vietnam veterans, the guys that only did what they were freaking told to do by their own fucking government. And the majority of them were Democrats, okay? The majority of them that sent us there were Democrats. We were the baby killers. We were the drug addicts. We were the rapists. All that crap, all right? Yeah. And it wasn't until, and I'll tell you what, to this day, I love the man. I love him. Tom Selleck came out with Magnum P.I. That was the first entertainment show that ever treated the military veteran with respect. Do you agree? Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. It's and it was created by uh, Donald P. Belisario, who is a veteran, yeah. and he wanted to make a show that talked about those subjects, and that's why it was so fucking good. And both of them are veterans because uh, once again, Magnum uh, Tom Selleck served in the Hollywood National Guard, just like uh, Sam Elliott uh, and Kurt Russell. A lot of those guys did, but I don't care. They still fucking served. They put U.S. Army on the left lapel of their uniform they right. had that on there and that means they're a brother of mine i never in my life was affected by anybody acting okay and i've known a lot of actors you know i've known a lot of actors mm -hmm. i have never been affected by anybody like Selleck's performance dealing with his own within the confines of the show of course his own vietnam experience and that affected me deep in my heart. It really did. A couple of those shows, I'll never forget one episode in particular. Do you remember his buddy, Mac? Yeah. The first Mac, okay. The one that was killed by the Russian agent? Yep. Okay. The end of that program, I was with my then wife, uh, the one that we had the child that died. Uh, this of course, before it happened, before my little boy died, uh, we were sitting there watching that. And at the end of that episode, Magnum had caught this guy out in the jungle. They had, they had run an operation to get this guy out of his car. Soviet agent, of course, back in those days, the Russians were the bad guys. And, uh, he, his code name, the Russians code name was Ivan. 
And Magnum looked at him. He said, Ivan, did you see the sunrise? Sunrise, today? yes. Great fucking line. And he said, yes. And he just went, bang. And that was the end of Ivan, the Soviet spy. Oh, yeah. That, that stuck with me all those years. Yeah, it was one of the best episodes of Magnum P.I. Uh, it's a two-parter. Um, I really like that story. I like the ending. It's a very Mickey Spillane ending. It's very Mickey Spillane, you know. Yeah. Uh, you see that, Lord Thoth? All hail Lord Thoth? Yeah, marking a lot of stuff here for us to look at before we leave. Good God, a lot of comments. God, you guys get way ahead of me. This is why I have Martin. Martin saves me. All right. Let's get to this one. Lord Thoth says, I have been wounded in the line of duty, suffer PTSD, and ha ha had to deal with a lot, but I move on once more unto the breach. Amen to that. Um, I have had a nurse or two give me a hug and a squeeze. <laughs> That's the you, Don. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Soul Assassin says, last thing you want to do is piss off a Vietnam vet. Uh, let's see. I am now in law enforcement, so I agree. Absolutely. Um, look, some of the best police officers I know active right now are veteran buddies of mine. And um, my buddy Shane Moore, retired, decorated, retired uh, police detective, homicide, um, also a veteran of the U.S. Navy. And uh, very good cop, very good uh, veteran, and a very good friend of mine. Uh, I want to get him on our show because I love that guy. I think you'd get a kick out of him. He's um, half uh, uh, Chippewa, half white, and uh, very good writer like yourself. Very good writer. Uh, Zach says, uh, I voted for Biden 6,000 times from Canada. Should I say? <laughs> 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 and then uh bush says uh zach you should be president you could actually say president so you already have a leg up on um <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see um lord thoth one of my best friends was airborne officer and he just passed away two weeks ago broke my heart toughest guy I ever knew they really are a lot of those guys really are man uh and um krampus jeeva says i never served they said I, I couldn't draw dicks on faces of dead people. <laughs> I find that was a, no job. And they wouldn't, me. yeah, but they wouldn't let you carry your bong around either. Yeah, Jesus. it's like, uh, this is my weapon. This is my bong. This is for killing. <laughs> this is for getting really high. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all of you that did serve, thank you, man. Thank you for your service as a fellow veteran. Uh, I feel it's important for us to thank you too, not just be thanked ourselves. And I don't Amen. know about you, Don. I get so uncomfortable when somebody fucking thanks me for my service. And like just recently at a convention, this lady walked up and she's like, I want to thank you for your service. And I said, lady, you, you should not thank me. I had too much of a good time doing it. You, it's never thank somebody for, well, for I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the things they enjoy doing. <laughs> I, when somebody comes up to me and thanks me, basically I'm, I'm polite. I say, well, thank you. You're welcome. But uh, the bottom line is it's water off a duck's back with me. I see it as way, way too little and decades too late. And that that's true. That, that may sound like I'm being a hardcore dick or a prick, but it's true. It, well, it, Vietnam it, vets were treated very badly when they returned. I remember my brother Steve when we picked him up. I watched him get spit on at the airport. Um, so yeah, and uh, and all of us should always say to all of our our veteran buddies that served in Vietnam in particular. Uh, and I've said it to you: welcome, welcome home, home. welcome, welcome home. home. And uh, but uh, I think the funniest one. I'm sharing this with you again here. I love telling this story when I was at Walmart looking for. Uh, birds, bird, bluebirds, um, general so mix, which I got some finally. Walmart's got it back in supply, but for a while they weren't selling it and they had moved everything, so I couldn't figure out where the hell it was. And as I'm walking up down the aisle, I was trying to find it. This I saw because I'm always situa situational awareness never leaves you as a veteran, you're always paying attention to everybody around you. 
uh, assessment. It's an assessment thing you're trained to do. And this hippie, his woman, and some old lady pushing a basket with an oxygen um, cannula on with a, a little e-tank in the upper basket, carting along, walking with her flip-flops and a moo-moo. And the hippie reaches out and grabs my fucking arm. And I turned and I clenched my fist going, oh, man, I've read about this shit happening at Walmart. I'm, I'm going to have one of those experiences where I'm going to beat the shit out of a hippie. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. So I turned and I looked at him. I'm like, yeah, I'm Frosty. You Frosty? And he says, sir, I want to thank you for your service. May I shake your hand? And I went, uh, uh, and it was a deer in headlights. I was a deer in headlights. I'm like, uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he shakes my hand, and I don't like shaking hands. People know that about me. So I shook his hand, and he let go, and I pulled my hand back, and I became consciously aware my hand is now filthy. So I clinch it because I touched a hippie, and uh, I put my hand down my side, and I'm looking at him, and, and he's like, I, I mean it, really. Thank you for your service. And I said, I you're welcome? <laughs> and I started to walk away, and I keep looking back at him as I'm walking down the aisle, because now I'm in panic mode because I touched his fucking hand and I've got to wash this hand before I can do anything. So I keep looking back and right when I got around that corner um, and could no longer see him, I fucking fat ass ran all the way to the back of the store to find the bathrooms. I get in there and I'm standing in front of that mirror trying to figure out, like I'm washing my hands just sitting there. And I'm like, how the fuck did he know I was a veteran? And I look at my arms. My arms are covered, so we can't see my, my military tat. I, I'm like, I'm not wearing any regalia on my jacket or my shirt. I keep washing. And then I'm shaking my hands off, and I look up in the mirror, and I have this hat on. This hat. This very hat. That could have been, that could have been a cloak. And I looked at that, and it's the packed bathroom. People are pissing and shitting in there. Every stall, everything was taken. And I verbally said out loud, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at myself. And I turned and everybody was like, all peace dreams stopped. <laughs> and they're all looking at me like, am I going to go crazy and kill everybody in the room? And I just looked at everybody and I pointed back at the mirror. I said, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> and I left. <laughs> Uh, but I do. I hate it when people thank me. But at the same time, you know, my now regular response is thank you for letting me serve. You know, and I like that. I like feeling like I'm thanking them back uh, because serving was the best thing that ever happened to me. I get uncomfortable, too, especially in uniform, just doing my job, ma'am, sir. Uh, absolutely. Uh, let me get try to get caught up here. Where am I? Uh, Lord Thoth. Now I'm. Always really appreciate it. Get humble. Yep. I think a good soldier usually has a, a large amount of humility. Um, I have several service members in the family, and I played COD. I have a, a lot of my military veterans were in my clan, and we were one of the number one clans on America's Army uh, on Battle BattleNet or whatever it's called. Um, said every act you ever. I'm not a soldier. Oh, hey, that's us. We got to go. So let me thank everybody. Um, I everybody, thank... Merry Christmas to Merry you. May Christmas. you and your family have a wonderful holiday. Happy New Year. And Absolutely. I don't know if we're going to be back next week or not. I hope so. I hope so. Because I like doing the show. Scott Lewis, Lord Thoth, Penny, Anima Confusa, Andy Morrow, Dust Wolf, and Dragon Ruse, Real Wade Nation, Zax. Z Joe's Atmosphere, Soul Assassin, Renee Cruz, Pat S, Parrothead, T shirt and historian, Mark C with a big D. I know I said that wrong. I did it on purpose. Eastland Burkholder, John O'Stades, Bush McFadden, Knight Rider. Did I get all you guys? I hope I got everybody. Lord Thoth, all hail Lord Thoth. Uh, I think I got everybody. Michael Moncrief is here. Michael. Hi, Mikey. How you doing? That's Keith's brother. That's Keith's brother watching us. All right. I'll see you guys next time. Don, you want to say, say one last thing before we go? Yeah. Be good. Don't eat too much this weekend. And tonight, a noggin we will go. Amen. It's time to get hammered. Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. We'll see you on the other side. Uh, I'll see you guys, but we will see you on the other side next week. Uh, everybody have a blessed holiday. Be safe. <laughs>